We are gathered in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Christian, the sovereign God calls you into his presence for worship. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad. Let all be put to shame who serve carved images, who boast of idols. Worship him, all you gods. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. And so let us rejoice in the Lord now by rising to sing our song of approach using the insert. Let's rise and sing in Christ alone. Go to our God in prayer. Lord, you are indeed most high above all the earth. You are exalted above all that there is in all of creation. You exceed any other object of our affection. And we gladly confess that this is true when we look at Christ alone. Jesus, you are the only hope we have in life and in death. You are the only Savior and Redeemer to be found. You are always good to us and always faithful to us. You indeed give us no guilt in life and no fear in death. You yourself have hushed the law's loud thunder, and you have quenched Mount Sinai's flame. In you the law is no fearsome threat, but instead it can be a delight. 
for it shows us your perfection and it shows us the path you have for us to imitate you by the power of the Spirit. In you, Lord Jesus, the gospel is good news of abundant grace. You have freed us to rejoice and enjoy and adore you. And so now as we gather together this morning, we pray that you would be glorified in our praises. Satisfy us with the goodness of your gospel. And by your spirit, be at work meeting us each where we need you. And so Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Our affirmation of faith this morning is the first two paragraphs of chapter 26 of the Westminster Confession of Faith on the communion of saints. The point is, we need each other. And that's a vital, non-negotiable part of our faith. And so Christians, what do we believe about the communion of saints? All saints who are united to Jesus Christ, their head, by his spirit and by faith, have fellowship with him in his graces, sufferings, death, resurrection, and glory. And being united to one another in love, they participate in each other's gifts and graces and are obligated to perform those public and private duties which lead to their mutual good, both inward and outwardly. It is the duty of professing saints to maintain a holy fellowship and communion in the worship of God and in performing such other spiritual services as help them to edify one another. It is their duty also to come to the aid of one another in material things according to their various abilities and necessities. As God affords opportunity, this communion is to be extended to all those in every place who call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing for a moment longer for our reading from Scripture. We're reading Psalm 138. It's a psalm of thanksgiving. Uh, it begins with a personal narrative of deliverance by the psalmist, then a statement that all kings of the earth will give thanks to God, at which we can pray for that that happens in the near future. And then it ends by predicting God's blessing, uh, asserting his eternal love, and then praying for God's presence. And, and as we go through this week, uh, verses 7 and 8 are, are particularly important, maybe something that we could memorize as we go through the issues that may hit us this week about God's preserving our life and his promises there. Uh, Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they've heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord 
will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Let us now take time to confess our sins, acknowledging that we are sinners who have taken refuge in Christ alone. And so let's first do so by corporately confessing our sins together using the bulletin, and then by taking a moment to silently confess our own individual sins. Let us humbly confess our sins unto our Heavenly Father, saying, Almighty, eternal, most just and gracious God, you are thrice holy. Yet our lives abound with apologies not made, repentance not completed, forgiveness not offered, brothers not respected, reputations not defended, peace not pursued, neighbors not loved, your Sabbaths are not kept, our appetites not restrained, parents not honored, spouses not cherished, children not trained, prisoners not visited, strangers not clothed, hungry not fed, providences ignored, envy unchecked, prayers unspoken, our fears are not conquered, the truth not defended, our feet unmoved, tongues unbridled, eyes unguarded, time wasted, talents wasted, treasure wasted. Lord Jesus, deliver us from our wretchedness, from the sugar of sin as well as its gall, so that with earnest hearts we may come to you, casting ourselves on you, trusting in you, crying to you, and being delivered by you. Amen. And so let's not silently confess our own sins and transgressions unto the Lord. O penitent saints, hear now the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Well, let's now rise and sing our psalm of thanksgiving. Psalm 57, verses 5 through 11. So that's your Trinity Psalter. Psalm 57, beginning in verse 5. Let's rise and sing. <clears throat>
Amen. Please be seated. As we prepare to return our tithes and offerings to God, let's hear from the Lord himself preaching in the Sermon on the Mount. May we be wise and obedient, considering closely what our Lord Jesus has to say about treasure. This is Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. And let us now take time to give back a portion of what God has given to us, doing so with thankful hearts, which know the true worth of real treasure. Please be seated. And let's now go to our gracious God in prayer. Father, you know that many of us have preoccupying thoughts this morning. There are cares and concerns, checklists and tasks that we can't quite rid from our minds. And so we pray that your glory would overshadow all these things. Lift our hearts with who you are. As we pause to pray and as we continue in worship, we pray that you would give us a praise-filled preoccupation on you. Lead us to marvel as the psalmist, for your steadfast love is great to the heavens and your faithfulness goes beyond the clouds. And so then make our chief prayer be this, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Father, do whatever would bring you and the Son and the Holy Spirit maximal glory. And do it as you continue to put all things under the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we lift up our many requests, knowing that nothing is beyond your power 
and that your goodness and grace are sure for us, your people. And so we begin, first of all, with the apostles urging that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. And so we thank you for and we pray for all our many leaders and representatives, from the mayor of Sierra Vista and the town council all the way up to President Joe Biden in the White House. We pray for all of these. We thank you for giving us such elected officials and for putting us in a nation of laws. And thus, we pray for all these executives, legislators, and justices. We pray that you would give each a holy fear and a holy wisdom that they might punish evildoers and reward those who do good. Thwart any plot of evil or any legislation of wickedness they may be entertaining. And use all of these leaders to continue to make this a land of justice and of peace. A land where we can lead peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified in every way. And Father, we also lift up to you our own denomination, the Presbyterian Church in America. As the elders of our church, both ruling elders and teaching elders, prepare to gather for general assembly in a few weeks, as we prepare to gather as the highest church court of our denomination to do your business, we pray that you would be at work giving the brothers a zeal for unity in the spirit and the bond of peace. May the glory of Christ, not the agendas of men, be the overarching attitude and goal of all the commissioners. May Christ be honored and glorified. May his church be defended and adorned in beauty. So we pray for the proceedings of the brothers in St. Louis in a couple weeks. Be at work in these brother commissioners even now. Make grace, truth, humility, and praise the motivation of all our elders. And also, Father, watch over this church, this congregation. Continue to bless and protect us. Bless us each in a continued personal holiness. Bless us each as you continue to conform us to the image of Christ. And so then bless this church with ever more holy, ever more faithful, and ever more loving members who rejoice to serve one another. Make us more and more as you would have us to be. And so then also protect us. Protect us from the besetting sins of the flesh which so easily entangle. Protect us from the alluring temptations of the world. Protect us from the vicious attacks and the dizzying deceptions of the devil. Lord, we know that as your people we have enemies, spiritual foes who, though defeated, still yet hate the church of Christ. And so, Father, bless our congregation and protect us. And Father, you know that so many in this body have their own needs. Some plead with you ceaselessly, whether that be for the soul of a loved one or from relief from bodily pain. You know all the prayers we utter. You know the groaning of our hearts. And as your psalmist says in Psalm 56, you even collect our tears in your bottle. We know that you intimately know our needs. And we know that you care so much more than we often feel like you do. And so we pray that you would meet those needs that are the, the members of this congregation have. Answer our prayers. Deliver the souls of beloved friends and family members. Give relief to the weary. Provide employment and wisdom for those in need. Lead doctors and nurses in wisdom as they tend to the needs of our bodies. Father, many here pray for healing. Many among our number have weak bodies, crippling illnesses, frightful fears, awful anxieties. Body, mind, and even soul ache. You know the great needs that each of us have. So we pray for you to minister to us. And in your providence, provide for these needs in both ordinary and in extraordinary ways. 
But whatever you do, however you spread your glory over all the earth, however you answer our prayers to your own glory, we pray that each one of us would be more and more satisfied in you. For we know that you are good and that your steadfast love endures forever. May we enjoy that truth and hold fast to that truth. And so help us to believe what you have revealed. Lord, many are our needs, numerous are our cares and concerns. And so we know that we should pray more. We know that we should pray more frequently and more freely. And so finally, we pray, asking for you to teach us to pray. Teach us to pray according to the pattern which our Lord Jesus gave to his disciples in his earthly ministry, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, this morning we continue our exposition of Ephesians, looking at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. You may remember that Ephesians 4 marks a shift in Ephesians, a shift from astounding truth to faithful application. And yet what we see here is a, is a bit more astounding truth. It's practical, applicable truth, but it's truth nonetheless. And so with that in mind, I'm, I'm yet again going to begin reading our text at verse 1 of chapter 4. And so now that you've found your place, I ask you to rise in honor of the reading of God's holy, inerrant, infallible, and inspired word. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. In verse 7, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And let's once again go to our God in prayer. Lord, be at work now in the ministry of the Holy Spirit as we hear from your holy word. Use these holy scriptures to conform us, to comfort us, and to convict us. We pray that you would challenge us and encourage us. Be at work now by your spirit in all those who are here and in all of those who are tuned in from afar. And by the Holy Spirit, give me that anointing and power that I need to rightly proclaim this word to the glory of Christ our Lord. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Christian unity has been the main message thus far in Ephesians 4. But what does such unity actually look like? I think one way we understand the goal of unity, that is, misunderstand it, is to inadvertently transform it into uniformity. So let me illustrate this misunderstanding, this common, uh, sympathetic, shall I say, understandable misunderstanding. If you're familiar with Star Trek, if you're a big fan of Star Trek, then I'm going to be over-explaining to you. 
But if you've seen The Next Generation or Voyager or the movie First Contact, you will know of those great cybernetic conquerors, the Borg. The Borg are villains in Star Trek. They're a civilization, if you can call them that, uh, where everyone has been assimilated. Everyone from multiple alien races has been linked together as part of a giant computer, and they've been butchered and implanted with cybernetics. There are no individuals in the Borg. There's just a vast army of drones which proves that this illustration is a little bit imperfect because some of you might know there is one individual and she's the queen and she's basically the pope. So that's illustrating a different thing. Uh, but here's what I'm after with the Borg, even in an imperfect illustration. When these villains arrive in their massive cube-shaped ships, they scan the good guy's ship with a bright green beam of light. And then over the intercom, you hear the following. You hear all of the drones on that ship speaking in unison saying this. We are the Borg. Lower your shields and surrender your ships. We will add your biological and technological distinctiveness to our own. Your culture will adapt to service us. Resistance is futile. Resistance is futile. All must be assimilated. If in your mind... Your idea of Christian unity veers towards a vision of resistance is futile uniformity. That is, everybody must immediately agree on all the same things and act the same and speak the same and have the same spiritual gifts and passions. Then you'll immediately understand why Paul continues his line of thought with verse 7. See, this is, is crucial for us. It, it isn't quite the main point of our text today. In fact, rather clearly, the main point of our text is that the Lord Jesus Christ is ascended in triumphant glory. But if we don't catch this key distinction between unity and uniformity, we'll miss the logic of the passage. We'll miss the so what of it all. Paul's unifying point in our verses today is this. Jesus Christ is supreme and triumphant. And so in these verses, we should see at least three important facets of this reality. The gift of Christ, the ascent of Christ, and the servants of Christ. So let's pick up in verse 7, where we see the gift of Christ. And let's return to that crucial logic. Chapter 4, verse 1, told us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called. Verse 3 told us that one of the chief hallmarks of such worthy walking is an eagerness to maintain the unity, literally the oneness of the spirit and the bond of peace. And then last week, we saw that perfect sevenfold foundation for such Christian unity, for such oneness. For there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. The constant hum of oneness should be deep in our bones by this point. The Christian life is meant to be one of Christian unity. And here's why the logic is so crucial. Paul can see and feel potential misunderstanding. And so begins verse 7, but. Paul needs to elaborate on what this oneness looks like. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Christian unity is then a unity in diversity, not a unity in uniformity. And so let me underline this. Christian unity is not Christian uniformity. Well-meaning, faithful brothers and sisters can will disagree. We'll be different because Christian unity is not Christian uniformity. Just as in the body of Christ, there are many members, so too the gift of Christ comes to each of us in a perfect and proportional measure, but not in this equal or exact the same measure. Or let's shift the illustration. 
Christian unity focuses on the family resemblance we all now have in union with Christ, our triumphant Lord. Christian unity is not focused on looking identical, as if we've all been issued that same gray jumpsuit when we come to the gulag. It's a family resemblance that shows we belong, not the uniform we must all wear. And so let's prove the point. But grace was given to each one of us. And referring to this gifting as grace, it should be clear that we receive what is not earned. It's unmerited, demerited favor. You didn't earn what you received from Christ. You don't deserve it. Not a bit of it. It's grace. It's all divine goodness and favor to you. And it's given. There's that gift quality already, even before the word appears in the text. You didn't purchase it. You didn't make any exchange to receive this from Christ. It's given to you, and it's given to you freely. And such gracious giving is done to each one of us. Each of us has been given such grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gift of Christ is a gift that comes from him. He is the sovereign giver. He's the omnipotent one, the one who searches hearts and knows needs. He is the one who gives to each one of us according to his own perfectly wise measure. Christ, he doesn't put us on a ration system where each and every one of us is given the exact same amount and exact same kind of grace. Instead of rationing the same to each, each of us, Jesus Christ gives to each as he himself pleases. To rewind us a good number of weeks, he gives to us what he feels like giving to us. To some, he gives abundantly in one way. To others, he gives abundantly in another. But he gives to all, and there is no injustice in his giving. He's the sovereign giver, and he is good in giving to each of us according to his measure. You know, it may be tempting to wish that we had the gifts of grace that some have, whether that be intellect, faith, family, eloquence, you know, what have you. But to jealously compare gifts is to miss the point of this unity and diversity. If we zoom out and we see what point Paul is making making here in the opening of chapter 4, we must realize that grace is given to each one of us not so that we might feel self-important. It's not for you or I to boast in ourselves. It isn't to make anyone think I'm indispensable for the kingdom. The gifts are given to each of us by Christ himself are not intended to build up self-esteem. Instead, the point is to build up the strength of our fellowship. It's to enhance and increase that real oneness that's at work here. And so elsewhere, as in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says this, Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. See, the spiritual gifting is for the common good. And Peter says likewise in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. As each has received a gift... Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The gift is given that we each might serve the saints to the glory of God. Peter there calls it varied grace. 
And that word for varied is the same word that we saw in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, for the manifold wisdom. Peter's describing a, a multicolored grace. There's that diversity of measure. It's vivid, varied, and beautiful. John Calvin, the the Genevan reformer, has great insight into this unity and diversity, as Paul puts it to us in verse 7. He says, bound up in this teaching is the truth that, and I quote, no member of the body of Christ is endowed with such perfection as to be able without the assistance of others to supply his own necessities. See, he's saying that each have a gifting according to Christ's measure to them, but none are the fullness, and therefore we each need one another. Christians need to be around other Christians. Christians need to join a church and worship together as the church, and Christians need to be involved in the work of the church. We each need the assistance of others. That's Christ's plan in giving to each of us according to his measure. Though in the flesh we can be jealous of others' giftings, we know that this diversity is is actually quite good. R.C. Sproul taught us that everyone is a theologian. But we know from our own experience that not everyone is an astute theologian. Not everyone is a great theologian. In a Reformed church, I know that there's this cultural pull to wish that all of us were such brains on a stick. We need great theologians, but that's not all that the church needs. And so not everyone is a gracious encourager, and not everyone is a vigilant watchman in prayer, and not everyone is a wise counselor. And not everyone is a joyful servant. Not everyone is gifted to serve in the same way. Not everyone has received a uniform measure of Christ's gift. And that's good for us all. Because we, the church, we need theologians and we need encouragers and prayers and counselors and helpers, all of them. We need all such giftings. And, 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 you know, dare I even say it, this unity and diversity may even include some of our diversity and denominations and theological tribes. See, I'm convinced that old school confessional Presbyterianism is the most biblical of the theological tribes. I wouldn't be what I am if I didn't think that I were right. But, you know, maybe my people aren't. You know, maybe none of our theological tribes have it 100% accurate. Maybe, just maybe, there's something that we're missing, something that we're minimizing. And maybe there's something that the Continental Reformed are missing, and that the Lutherans and the Anglicans and the Baptists and the Methodists all might be missing. Maybe all of us have something right, and none of us have it all right. And and maybe there's a benefit to this theological diversity among brothers, just as there is in that diversity of gifts. You know, so just so that the astute theologian always has that prayerful watchman at hand. And so likewise, maybe it's a great thing that us regulative principle loving Presbyterians can always find an evangelism loving Baptist just down the street. You know, I, I was thinking about a joke I first heard as a Baptist joke. Uh, but it can really be used for any denomination. And if you look it up online, it is. But, but the gist of the joke is along this line. It, it, there's folks who are entering heaven, a long line of folks. And everyone is told to be quiet as they pass this one part of heaven. And so finally somebody pipes up, probably an old school Presbyterian, and asks why we have to be quiet around this one place in heaven. And they're told, we be quiet because they think they're the only ones here. So long as we're brothers and sisters, so long as we will all be there together in glory, 
we surely need each other in some way. And so then, by the same token, we should be careful about the diversity even in our own denomination. If we spoke in humility and in zeal for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, if we spoke as brothers united to Christ our Lord, we may discover that no camp or tribe in the PCA is completely right or completely wrong. The sovereign, supreme gift-giving of Christ our Lord is that note that reminds us that our Christian unity is not Christian uniformity. And it is that glorious truth about Christ our Lord which leads us to our second facet, the ascent of Christ and verses 8 through 10. Paul writes, Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Though it, it seems quite counterintuitive for the way that we ordinarily use the English language, what the ESV sets apart for us in the parentheses there is actually the main point of our passage today. The decent and ultimate triumphant ascent of Christ. That's what's at the heart of what's going on here. And so following the logic is our key in this text. And so verse 8 says, therefore it says. And then Paul references, he doesn't quite quote, but he references Psalm 68, verse 18. And some will tell you that this is the most difficult Old Testament citation to be found in the New. And there's good reason why they say that. But let's look at it. And what I want you to first notice is that Paul writes, Therefore it says. There's this common phrase used by the writers of the New Testament to signal that they are about to quote Scripture. The writers will say, it is written. In the Greek, gagraptai. But Paul does not use that stock phrase here. Instead, he uses a different word, legai. It says. And so we should be clued in from the beginning of this citation that what's presented here should not necessarily be taken as a verbatim scriptural reference. Something else is going on. Something important is actually happening right here in this verse. And so to get where we're going, Paul's citation is not him saying that Christ's gift giving of verse 7 is explained by Psalm 68, but instead that Christ's victorious gift giving itself explains Psalm 68. Well, why don't you turn there with me to Psalm 68? Part of what makes this one of the most difficult Old Testament citations is that it's from an immensely complex psalm. Psalm 68 is an expansive, wonderful psalm. And as we look over Psalm 68, we should first notice that superscription. It's to the choir master. So it was for Israel's use in gathered worship. It's a psalm of David. King David, the great king of Israel, who was promised a faithful descendant to sit upon his throne forever, is the author of this psalm. And finally, it's a psalm. And perhaps that final detail seems a little bit superfluous to us. But I think it highlights for us that overall message of Psalm 68. This is a joyous song about the ultimate victory of Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel. And so the psalm has a structure, a bit like a, a battle march. And it rehearses God's victoriousness in terms of Old Testament history. And so in verses 1 through 3... There's this overarching image of Yahweh roused for battle, with his praising people rejoicing in his presence. They're following behind him as he marches out to war. And then verses 4 through 6 depict Yahweh as the God of the wilderness, 
leading his people out of slavery and adopting the orphan, defending the widow. Verses 7 through 10 shows him as the God who led his people from Sinai to Canaan. He watched over the wilderness generation. In verses 11 through 14, we see him as the God who laid waste to the Canaanites, conquering the promised land for Israel. And so especially notice, for our purposes today, verses 15 through 18, showing as God as the victorious general making his way to his special, chosen, holy mountain, the place where he himself is going to settle. And as he makes his way there in a victory march, we see that he is leading a parade, and his chariotry is twice 10,000. And verse 18 is the crucial capstone of this psalm. He has gone up in victory. He's gone up at the head of his victory procession to dwell in his sanctuary. And so everything turns. In verses 19 through 23, we see God's people enjoy a blessed life under the kingship of their triumphant God. Verse 20 even goes so far as to say that Yahweh's people have been delivered from death itself. In verses 24 through 27, we see Yahweh enthroned in his holy place, surrounded by the praise of his people. And then verses 28 to the end of the psalm show all the ends of the earth, kings included, being called to praise God. The kings of the nations are even beckoned to bring gifts unto the Lord God. And then at the very, very end, verse 35, we see that Yahweh is generous to his people in victory. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. As we skim over this psalm, we see that acting as a prophet, David pens this song of an expansive vision of the triumph of God. And in verse 18 of Psalm 68, David wrote, You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train, and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. And that doesn't quite read like Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, does it? And that's because Paul is doing something more than merely quoting a Bible verse. Paul is engaging in what can be called a restrained use of the ancient rabbinic practice of Midrash Pesher. A Midrash is is that ancient rabbinic tradition of interpreting Scripture in the process of referencing it. It's an interpretive commentary that adapts the wording of the biblical text to its application in the current situation. And so, though some rabbis uh, abused this practice, it isn't necessarily bad. In fact, here at Grace, you could say that we do it every single week. Every Lord's Day morning, Our bulletin has the minister begin the service by saying, we are gathered in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And every week, our bulletin puts Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, as the scriptural citation for that statement. Except we know that Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, doesn't literally say we are gathered. That verse is the baptismal formula in the Great Commission. But by way of interpreting and applying that passage, we believe that it is in the triune name that Christians gather together in worship. We can say it's a bit of a midrash. And so in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, Paul looks at Psalm 68 and says that the teaching of the whole psalm is actually about Jesus, the triumphant warrior. Christ's gracious giving of gifts to his people explains Psalm 68, especially that capstone, verse 18. It's Christ's gracious gift giving. 
It's Christ's glorious victory that opens up the meaning of Psalm 68. And so Paul, in addressing his audience, changes the yous found in Psalm 68 to he. So he's talking about, not to, God. That's not such a big change in citing scripture. And as you read this verse in Ephesians, you'll see that he ascended on high. Still, a good translation. And he led a host of captives. The Greek right there is a little bit funny. He led captive captivity. But that's how the Septuagint translates that same Hebrew phrase. It's a good Greek translation. And John himself actually seems to be referencing the same statement in Revelation chapter 13, verse 10. It's a little bit idiosyncratic of Greek, but it isn't Paul's signature flourish. It's a standard translation. And Calvin actually points out for us that Paul's Greek construction here, that captivity is a collective noun for captive enemies. And the plain meaning is that God reduced his enemies to subjection, which was more fully accomplished in Christ than in any other way. And so at this point, even in the citation, as believers with a whole New Testament in our hands, we should think of what Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. That on the cross, Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Or even think back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, thinking of that prince of the power of the air, now defeated in the gracious working of God in Christ. All the dark spiritual powers are defeated. And they're being drug along in this victory march as a conquered foe. Now, that's how it happened in the ancient world. Whether that be in the Old Testament or in the Roman world, defeated, surrendered foes would be paraded alongside the victorious general, exposing those defeated to open shame. And then Paul puts his interpretive twist on the citation. The inspired, correct interpretive twist. Since Jesus is Yahweh, and since Jesus is ultimately victorious over all God's enemies, defeating sin and death and Satan, he then gives gifts to men. Psalm 68, 18 has Yahweh receiving tribute from his defeated enemies. But verse 12 of Psalm 68 shows the women among his people dividing the spoil of the defeated, right? his people profit. And then verse 35 ends that psalm saying that Yahweh is the one who gives power and strength to his people. This citation then makes a good deal of sense here in Ephesians. Think back to the themes we've seen so far in three chapters. The triumph of the Lord and the Gentiles streaming in to worship the Lord as well as the Lord's generosity from the riches of his grace. They're all prominent concerns throughout Ephesians. We've seen this all in the letter before. And so in this one brief interpretive citation, Paul says, Jesus gives gifts to men. He divides the spoil with his people. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people in the form of his gracious gift. Psalm 68 is then all about Jesus. Paul says. And Paul is right. It's likely that Paul is thinking also of even more of the Old Testament, even as he makes this one citation. He, he certainly must be thinking of Psalm 2 as being all about Jesus as the son to whom the kings of the earth are urged to kiss his feet. And that's how we should read scripture as well. Not engaging in careless or creative midrash but in reading Christ exactly where he is in Scripture. Everywhere. And so in investigating Paul's citation here, we realize that Paul reads the Old Testament and believes that Jesus is at the heart of all Scripture. He is the center. And moreover, he reads Scripture and believes that Jesus is the organic end, the telos of everything revealed to us. Paul reads Scripture knowing that all of Scripture has God the Holy Spirit as its singular main author, and that all of Scripture thus tells us one story, 
one plan of redemption, and that that plan of redemption finds its beating heart and its end goal in Christ crucified and raised unto glory. Paul reads Scripture just like the Reformed do in our confessions. All of Scripture is about Jesus as the one and only Redeemer of mankind. And this method of reading Scripture is critical. You'll never understand the Reformed if you can't read the Old Testament like Paul reads it. You'll never understand our form of government, our doctrine of the sovereignty of God and salvation, our theology of the covenants, let alone our insistence on sprinkling or pouring water on even the infant children of believers, or, most weird of all, our spooky, mystical view of the Lord's Supper. You'll never understand it. All of Scripture is God's Scripture. He has revealed it all, and it's all about Jesus. He is at the heart of all Scripture, and he is the organic end goal. He's the point of it. So as we finish considering verse 8, we realize that Paul is looking at Jesus in marveling wonder. He is the sovereign, gracious giver who has ascended on high in victory. What Psalm 68 prophetically proclaimed, Christ has done. And likewise, then our eyes ought to be in rejoicing wonder on Christ Jesus alone. And I think right here in this verse, Paul not only exhibits some great Old Testament literacy, but as he continues, we find him exhibit a knowledge of the apostolic teaching. Because Paul references John chapter 3. In John 3, as Jesus is teaching Nicodemus, just before our Lord himself makes a rather wonderful Old Testament citation, Jesus says this, John chapter 3, verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Paul says in Psalm 68, teaching that Christ ascended, it implies that he descended because that's what Jesus said. Only the Son of Man who descended in humiliation is the one who can, ex- who can ascend victorious into heaven. Paul even describes the descent of Christ as descent into the lower regions, the earth. This means that the descent of Christ went as low as possible. The Son of Man taking on human flesh was him descending low. Taking on the humiliation of life in a fallen world was descending still lower. And it was yet lower descent for him to be humbled by death, even death on a cursed cross. And then he descended even unto the lower regions, the earth, and not only being humiliated unto death, but in being buried in a borrowed tomb until the third day. He descended. Jesus had to stoop so low. He had to be so humiliated in order for him to be the victorious, exalted one. But notice that imbalance that's there between verses 9 and 10. He stooped low, yes, but his exalted glory and ascension is exceedingly higher, far above all the heavens, and he is so highly exalted that he might fill all things. He is the victor over all the cosmos. And we've already seen this language of filling all things. We, we saw it in chapter 1, verse 23. In chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. And in chapter 3, verses 17, 19, and 21. Yeah, this is Paul's language in the book of Ephesians of the glory presence of God himself filling his new creation temple. And his new creation temple is us, the body of Christ. That is the end aim of all that he is at work doing, even in giving his gifts He is filling all things even now as he draws us to himself and as he draws history to its end, as he draws us together, building us up as his new creation temple. Well, let's then move to our third facet and briefly consider the servants of Christ, looking at verses 11 and 12. We're going to return to these verses and following next week because there's absolutely no way that we can exhaust what Paul has to say this week. 
But I, I want us to feel the flow of the logic today. Christ supreme has given gifts to his people. He's done so for our common good and our mutual edification. And he has done so as the totally triumphant Lord. And so if there is one way that he gives gifts to his people that exhibits that such gifts of grace are for the common good, it is in Christ giving servants to his church. And so verse 11 And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. And verse 12 tells us that he has given such servants for the common good of his church, of the body. And so there it is. It's explicit in our text at the end. But Christ gave to his church apostles. Apostle literally means a sent out one. And here in Ephesians 4.11, we're thinking of the 12 plus Paul. These are those servants sent out by Jesus that laid the foundation of the church. You know, though you can find in the New Testament a few uses of a more casual understanding of apostle, you know, more as those sent out as missionaries. Paul is speaking here of foundational servants. And likewise, they're prophets. These aren't the Old Testament prophets, but those who are given God's word, or more likely, his word of interpretation. These, again, are Christ's servants in the foundational era when the New Testament was incomplete. And finally, there are evangelists. Though we use this term for folks who preach the good news, this is a New Testament-specific office. These are those folks like Philip and Timothy and the likes of Luke who serve as the authorized assistants of the apostles. They are helping lay the foundation of the church. And then Paul presents us with a pair that are lumped together, the shepherds and teachers. And these offices, these gifts persist even after the apostolic age. These are shepherds. These are pastors of specific flocks and those who Christ is equipped to teach. The first three offices, we may say, have some analogs today, but they've all ceased. There are no more apostles, prophets, or evangelists in the sense that Paul means here. But Christ will keep giving to his church shepherds and teachers. That's why they're lumped together. They're not combined because they represent one thing, but they're lumped together because they persist even after the closing of the canon. Some do try to combine them, and it just doesn't hold up. Um, Just listen to Calvin's criticism. He writes, "I, I partly agree with them that Paul speaks indiscriminately of pastors and teachers as belonging to one and the same class. But a man may be a teacher who is not qualified to preach. And so to speak in analogs here, there are pastors, shepherds in charge of specific flocks who preach the word week in and week out. And there are teachers, whether they be ruling elders who must be apt to teach, or whether they be a teacher from a seminary or a professor or even a Sunday school teacher. The two, shepherd and teacher, should not then be confounded, but they do belong together in the same class. They're servants of Christ that he's given to his church during this age. And as we look at the five offices listed, we should notice that there is a common thing that ties all five together. These servants of Christ have each been specifically gifted to minister the word of Christ. As Michael Allen writes, Jesus rules his sheep by his word, and he builds his sheep up, sheep up through that word, through the ministry of those who he sends as officers of that very same word. The ministry of the word and the power of the Holy Spirit is that chief gift given to build up the saints. There are, have been, and always will be men who make the pulpit about themselves. Pride can grow wildly right here. It can be dangerous. But that's not what this is for. That's not why Jesus calls and gifts people like Pastor Ken and myself. We are servants of Christ, gifted to give the word of Christ to the people of Christ for their common good, for your common good. In the unity of Christ's body, he gives a diversity of gifts. All such gifts are given by Christ for the good of his people. And the greatest good is the good he accomplishes through his servants ministering the word. That is, the greatest good that Jesus accomplishes is through his own word. And so if you want to know for sure that Jesus Christ is the triumphant, ascended Lord, you'll know it by his holy word at work in your heart, even right now. 
And Lord willing, that should make you just as jubilant as Paul. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the supreme victorious one. You descended even unto the lowest regions, and you stooped so low as to be under the power of death in a borrowed tomb. But you rose in resurrection life. You burst the bonds of death, and you rose higher and higher, ascending even to the high heavenlies. You are the one who ascended on high, and we praise you. So Jesus, satisfy us with the measure of your gift you've given to each of us. May we be zealous for unity and joyous at the diversity of gifts given. May we so praise and glorify you, Lord. And Jesus, use your gifts for our common good, even this word that was just preached. Use it to build our faith in you. Use it to glorify yourself and to satisfy us. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is hymn number 254, Alas, it did my Savior bleed. That's hymn 254. Let's rise and sing together. Please be seated.